Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It is a coincidence that I'm speaking today on the day that um, you, the church, has nominated me to be an elder of the church. Um, the pastor called me some six weeks ago asking if I would be available today. So this is, this is a coincidence. But I'll start with a little bit about myself. Um, it seems fitting. I became an Adventist in 2008, so that is almost 15 years ago. And it was through a Revelation seminar. Amazing facts. I wasn't looking for a change. I was just um, 17 years old and not really looking for anything. I was just, I had my music that I liked. It was not godly. I had the, my entertainment that was also not godly. Um, I was raised Christian, uh, non-denominational. So I grew up believing a lot of the things that, that typical Protestants uh, believe. But that prophecy seminar was eye-opening. It was awesome. I had never seen the Bible like that. And that really created within me a desire to continue to study the Bible myself. And so that, that's going to lead us into today's topic, which is a bit about how to study the Bible. And the first thing is your attitude. You have to come with the right attitude when you open the Word of God. And that attitude, one of those attitudes, humility. Come to the Bible with an attitude of humility. I don't know anything, and I need somebody higher than me to teach me from this book, this holy book. And that person is the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you. And in the book of Job, where the question is posed, canst thou by searching find out God? We are human, but God is higher. God is divine. When you go in search of truth, which is what Bible study should be, do not think that in your own power you can discover truth. You can't. It's not in you to discover truth. Truth is revealed. In Matthew 16, Matthew chapter 16, And verses 16 and 17. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Truth is revealed. And truth is a divine quality. In Deuteronomy we see, God is a God of truth. 1 John 5, 6 says, The Spirit beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. Jesus says of himself, I am the truth. We see in the Bible, the Trinity is truth. So truth is not discovered in our, own, in our own power, in our own might, in our own wisdom. Truth is revealed by God. And it's revealed as a reward for a search. Jeremiah, 
29.13. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. When you go looking for God, when you seek out God, he rewards that search with a revelation of himself. Psalm 119, David asks, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, I'll give you a moment to turn there with me as well. It's God that reveals himself to us. We don't find God in our own might. We're in Acts chapter 16, 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Now we see here of this woman Lydia, that the Lord opened her heart, and then it says, she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And this leads us to the second essential attitude, and that is a willingness, a willingness to do what God shows you when you open his word. When you read the Bible, when God speaks to you, you have to have that willingness to do what he says. John 7:17 7, says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Whether it be of God. And so a willingness to obey what is revealed is essential to understanding the word of God. It's not enough to have knowledge. It's not enough to know the truth. God wants his people to be a people of action. Third. Third. So we have humility. Understand it's not in your own power. A willingness. Do what God shows you from his word. Third. Remove sin from the life. Sin separates you from God. We see in Isaiah 59 too. And I'm going to turn there. In Isaiah 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sin interferes with the comprehension of divine things. If sins are not confessed, that sinful condition will inevitably corrupt your understanding of God's word. Understand that Satan can cause confusion. We can be deceived. If we're puffed up in our own estimation. So those are the attitudes. Humility. Come to the Bible with humility. Humble yourself before God. Be willing to do what he shows you from his word. Confess your sin. Remove it. And now a practical, some practical. As you study, as you read, read from multiple translations. I have 
predominantly used the King James Version. That's the Bible that I use for most of my study. But you don't get the whole picture from one translation. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8. Show an example. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8. In the King James Version, it says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? But what do other translations say? What's a more, a more correct translation of that verse? Does anybody have it in another translation? Shout it out. Joshua, yes. Most, most other translations correctly will name Joshua in that verse. Joshua that came after Moses. But when I read this verse as a young Adventist, I thought it was a proof text for the Sabbath. I thought it was saying, see, Jesus didn't change the Sabbath. It says so right here. Read in multiple translations. Next, understand the context of your passage. Read the surrounding verses to get the full picture of what's going on. And to illustrate, let's turn, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to read first from verse 8. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Who's familiar with this verse? Who's familiar with this text? Are we all? How is this verse used in other churches? Life after death. The soul departs, is present with the Lord, right? But let's take a moment and let's read the whole context for this verse. Verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, what's our earthly house? This body, right? If our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So our earthly house is our bodies. What's the building of God, the house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens? Would be a heavenly body. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. We have struggles on earth, and sometimes it's hard. And Paul saw a lot of troubles, did he not? And he's saying that he desires, he seeks after that that heavenly body, that translation. If so be that being clothed 
we shall not be found naked. So we have an earthly body, our earthly house, a heavenly body. So what is this when he says that we would not be found naked? I think it's an expression that he doesn't desire for death, that in between where you, you're not in an earthly body, you're not in a heavenly body, you're just without, you're resting. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, for that we would be un, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. We're burdened, but he's saying we're not wishing for death. We're just wishing for that glorified body. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Now there's another one that in the King James it's not immediately obvious what that means, the earnest of the Spirit. Most, a lot of other translations will replace that word earnest with guarantee. Guarantee to view the Holy Spirit as a, as a guarantee of the life hereafter. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, there's a reason why Paul said that Peter is easy to misunderstand, that people rest his words to their own destruction. Paul isn't always, it's not always clear. Paul, you have to work with his words, but you also have to know that the Bible won't contradict itself. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, that is this body, right? This body on earth, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And now we get to verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. So here we come to this, this verse. It's not a statement on the state of the soul after death. It's an expression of desire to be with God instead of being here. But we can see that if you don't read the whole context and carefully, you can come to a wrong conclusion, especially if you approach the Bible with preconceived notions. Now we're going to bring it to a close. The attitudes. Come to the Bible with the proper attitude, an attitude of humility, a willingness to do what God shows you, And confess your sin. Don't let sin get in between you and God. As you study, use multiple translations. Get the full picture. Finally, last couple of points. Use a Bible concordance. There's a principle in study known as the law of first mention. When you're studying a topic, go in the Bible to the place where that topic is first discussed. If you're doing a study on diet, you're not going to go to 1 Timothy 4.4 4, where it says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. That's not where you would start your study. You would go to Genesis 1.29 where the diet is first introduced. If you want to do a study on grace, you'd go in Genesis, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Justification by faith, Genesis 15. And Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. You go where the topic is first introduced in the Bible. And concordances are a great help. 
because you look up a word and it shows you everywhere in the Bible that word is used and you can go to the first one. Concordances are great for learning the meaning of names as well. Commentaries. Commentaries are a great help. They're an enhancement to your study. They are usually written by very well-educated men and women with expertise in various studies, linguistics, history, geography, etc. And then, after you do your own research, let God speak to you first, and then see what Ellen White has to say on the topic. And there's a great resource, if you aren't already aware, egwwritings.com. You can do a word search. And it'll show you in her works where she uses the word or phrase, however you want to do your search. But do your own research before you start consulting outside sources. You want to use them. You don't want to rely on them to think for you. You want to be able to do the study yourself and let them be enhancements. Now let's go to Acts, chapter 17, and verse 11. And we're going to wrap it up. My kids are taking advantage of the fact that they outnumber my wife. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. If those of Berea had the mindset to go and double-check Paul, to study the Bible, to make sure that they were being told the truth. How much more should we be in the Word? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, We look around us, we see the news, we see our friends, we see our families. Lord, we know the time in which we live. It's not long, it's not long until your son will come and take us home. We look around. Lord, we are living in the last days. Let us be in your word. Let us run to you. When there's problems too big for us, when we see things happening in loved ones' lives, and we just don't know what to do, let us run to you. Let us humble ourselves before you, and let us allow you to work through us. Your word says the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Let us labor with you. And these things we pray in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.